hello and welcome to Reading Between the Lines, an economic unpacking of John Scott Clubs and Elmer Mesner's cartoons. After a brief, brief introduction from me, we will first have Dr. Jeanette Mitchell and then Dr. Javier Espinoza talk about the cartoons they have selected to focus on and then open it up for questions and discussion if we have time. Um, if you do have any questions as you're thinking of them, feel free to bring them into the chat and I'll be monitoring uh, the chat. Uh, this is the third and final program planned in conjunction with the RIT Archives digital exhibit, Epidemics, Economics, and Elections, the editorial cartoons of John Scott Club and Elmer Mesner. We have designed program programming to complement each of the three E's. Today's program, just in time for tax season, I hope everybody's done their taxes, um, is for economics. Uh, for the epidemics, which we had, uh, we had a program in March called the Timeless Cultural Iconography of Graphic Medicine, and in late October, we had a program around elections called Analyze This. Um, the tape for the Timeless Cultural Iconography of Graphic Medicine will be up in the website uh, in a couple of weeks, and we didn't uh, tape Analyze This. Um, they didn't want that um, taped. Um, so John Scott Club, uh, who worked, who, his dates are 1875 to 1934, and Elmer Mesner, uh, who lived from 1901 to 1979, worked at the Rochester Times Union, a daily newspaper, as editorial cartoonist. Together, the over 6,000 cartoons of Club and Mesner span a century of change in Rochester, New York, and the United States. Editorial cartoons are snapshots of the culture in which they are, were created and can be difficult to translate through a modern lens. Collectively, the cartoons address major issues in local United States and international history from World War I and Prohibition to the Cold War and the Civil Rights Movement. The curatorial team set out by selecting themes resonant to today and contextualized them for a contemporary audience. This project is an ongoing collaborative effort between uh, RIT archive staff, the RIT Library's Digital Humanities Librarian, RIT faculty and students, and a Rochester community member and RIT archives donor. The vision driving the work behind this project is to make these obscure and essentially hidden cartoons accessible and relatable. In the spirit of inclusion and accessibility, the digital exhibit intentionally steers away from stringent academic scholarship to allow for a myriad of voices to be represented. In addition to integrating the digital exhibit into teaching at RIT, we are creating a program that aspires to draw members from RIT and beyond to interact and engage with the cartoons featured in the exhibit. Epidemics, economics, and elections will continue to evolve as RIT faculty and students from a wide range of disciplines and members of the larger Rochester community create responses in all mediums to the cartoons. We are excited to have you with us for this program and want to give a big thanks to RIT economics faculty, Dr. Javier Espinoza and Dr. Jeanette Mitchell for their participation, participation in today's program. I will quickly read their bios um, and then I will give the floor to um, Dr. Mitchell. Dr. Jeanette Mitchell is um, a associate professor and undergraduate program director for the economics department here at RIT. Her specializations include political economy and history of economic doctrines. Professor Mitchell has been a faculty advisor for students who have done research on the relationship between man and machine as predicted in political cartoons during the industrial revolution. And Dr. Espinoza is an associate professor and, chair of and is the chair of the Department of Economics here at RIT. And he has published works in the areas of health economics, labor econo economics and public finance. Currently, he is a co-PI for a randomized control trial study of a local economic mobility program called Bridges to Success. All right, so I'm going to give the floor to Dr. Jeanette Mitchell. Thank you so much for that, Liz. So the cartoons that I picked from that vast collection um, indicate large themes in the economics discipline and in society. So one, this first one, you can see the coal strike is hampering needed production. This is 1946, but you could take it way back. Um, the view, it used to be the view that uh, labor and capital were not intrinsically conflictual. The relationship between them was not 
conflictual. They were both working toward production and then they would share the output. So that's called the productivity ethic. And they believe that very strongly in the United States, workers and capital. So a lot of your early labor unions actually forbade striking because strikes were considered, you know, really stepping on the toes of the corporations. So, um, so this one here, we see, you know, that the coal strike is stopping the movement of needed production and labor is always accused of doing stuff at inappropriate times. So, um, during World War II, there were several strikes in the United States and in fact, across the world. And if you think about the COVID crisis just recently, the nurses across the nation were striking and organizing around COVID. So you think, well, these people are essential. They're important. What are they doing striking? But they also have a right to um, take care of themselves and take care of their families and most of the emphasis is not on salary as most people think, it is on working conditions and safety. And that was the case under the COVID as well. So um, can we move to the second one? Thank you. And here you see the same kind of thing, um, very anti-union in his uh, cartoons. So you can see on the horns of this billy goat, you've got strike and uh, what is that? Yeah, my eyes are so bad these days. Threat CIO um, demand for more salary, wage boosts. So the CEO, CIO was um, pushing very hard for increased wages, but not just increased wages and not even primarily increased wages. There was a huge movement at the turn of the 20th century to try to get down to an eight hour day. So we were at 10 hours a day working, six days a week, and labor wanted the eight hour day. So they fought really hard for the eight hour day. And you can see that that might hamper production, right? And um, Adam Smith, the father of all economics, once said in the struggle between labor and capital, capital will always win. And the reason capital will always win is there's fewer of them, so they're easier to organize, right? The cigars in the back room kind of thing. The second reason that they will always win is that they have public opinion and the media on their side, the capitalists do. And then the third reason that they can win is they can hold out longer than labor can. So labor has to get back to work because they're always living right on the, right on the edge. And so they have to get back to work. They can't prolong uh, a walkout or a strike. So again, the idea that I had students um, frequently argue in my classes that labor unions are greedy, greedy because of the demands for uh, wage hikes. But again, you know, you have to look at what unions provided to us. So combination of unions and the GI Bill is responsible for the creation of the middle class in the United States. So the unions gave us weekends, right? Unions gave us um, retirement accounts, medical coverage, dental coverage, vacation pay, sick leave. That all came from the demand by unions for those things. And then we as professionals, if unions are getting it, we want it too. So a lot of our benefits package comes from the struggles that unions have done over time. And you can see the benefits package starting to um, disintegrate as unions become less important. And hey, Jeanette, can I interrupt for a moment and just make a couple comments? Please. So uh, something that occurred to me when I was looking through these cartoons and, and especially, so clubs cartoons are earlier and then Messers uh, are a little bit later, but they really, if you start from the beginning with club, they go from about the 19 teens uh, through what Jeanette's taking us through here, I think even to the 1950s or 60s. Uh, but what's interesting is that this is the time of the rise of labor. Um, you know, corporations, um, which 
and the ability to incorporate in the U.S. starts in the late 19th century. Uh, and firms really have it, you know, looking back, really have a good thing going. Uh, they are not exposed to litigation, even when they're like blatantly at fault for creating an unsafe working environment. And so it's through the unionization that we start getting all of these changes. Uh, for example, um, concern over the indoor air quality in a manufacturing plant. Um, and so anyway, so this is beginning in the early 20th century, the labor movement's growing. And then we get into the 19, the end of the 1920s and the Great Depression hits. Now, up till then, the federal government was still a pretty small enterprise in the United States. Not that they were tiny, but they just wouldn't be as large as what we would see after World War II. Uh, and so with the rise, with the Great Depression, uh, there were different responses at first. Um, and then what happened was, uh, at least from my take, Jeanette, you're welcome to chime in here, but the FDR comes in and starts to expand the size of government, expand the government's role in providing assistance uh, in, in rebounding the economy. Um, yeah, and the, so Herbert, Herbert Hoover had the dual misfortune of being president at the onset of the Great Depression. And he was also an adherent to the notion that the market performed automatically to bring about optimal solutions. So you didn't need government intervention. And right. government was seen as having three major roles and that's it. So, you know, they took the Lockean view that government was a necessary evil. So the functions for government were national defense, domestic tranquility, and the production of legitimate public goods. Right. And that's it. And even, even Chamberlain in England, when people were saying, hey, you know, because England was suffering 10% or higher unemployment all through the 1920s, when we were doing the roaring 20s, uh, they were suffering from really high unemployment. And so people were saying, why don't you build roads? we got all these cars and they have to go through mud and all of that. Let's build roads and put people to work. And Chamberlain said famously, if it's economic to build roads, then the private sector should do it. If it's not economic to build roads, then the government should not be doing it. So the view that government was a necessary evil and didn't even have the responsibility of um, building roads. Uh, now, one thing I do want to say about FDR is that people don't give enough credit to the Soviet Union in the influence on policy. So you have capitalism and the Great Depression showing that total failure of the market system, 25% unemployment, people living on garbage dumps, you know, for access to food, riots when the garbage dumps came in with new food and stuff. So that was capitalism and it was global, right? Every nation that was capitalist was suffering the same kind of issue. And then over here, you have the Soviet Union growing at a conservative estimate of 14% per annum and guaranteed employment and full employment. So those two things together meant that the government had to do something, not sit on their hands, couldn't wait for it to just go away like they had historically. I mean, we've had financial crises going way back and we just sit around and wait for it to go away. But that's no longer plausible if you have a Soviet Union showing that planning works and growth happens. As okay, so this is going to be my last comment, and then I'll let out because uh, oh. it's. Uh, but so my point was going to be so then with the Great Depression, the role of the federal government expands, and then World War II comes, and now and so the federal government starts fixing prices, uh, commodity prices, starts getting its hands into the market and controlling them, uh, and then in the World War II, essentially the military is controlling everything all the prices that it's paying for things and, and, it's, and the amount of investment that the federal government is engaging in, investment that will eventually, we will just turn right over to private business. So we're investing in large firms to get even bigger. And then at the end of the war, that those firms which benefited from the taxpayer and from this public debt, they are going to benefit from having these 
larger factories and having these larger institutions uh, essentially monopolizing these markets. Um, and then once after, right when we get out of World War II, then we start this reconversion of, well, now we need to get rid of all of these price fixing arrangements that we have. Um, anyway, so I just wanted to just note like the, the changing size of the federal government and its involvement in, in, uh, in the markets really uh, was substantial. That change was substantial at, uh, around the 20s, 30s and 40s. Indeed, and if you look at the uh, New Deal, the kinds of things that we got passed in the New Deal were things like the minimum wage, social security, the legalization of unions and the establishment of collective bargaining in which the government was expected to support labor's interests against the interests of capital. So all of these great big responsibilities that government was taking on at the federal level, um, and then in 1946, right after the war, they were really afraid that we were going to return to another Great Depression. And so the Full Employment Act was passed, it was later named the Employment Act, uh, that gives government not just a role to play in the economy, a favorable role, but also the responsibility of ensuring price stability and uh, adequate levels of employment. So this is a huge change from the Chamberlain view that, you know, government has nothing to do with the economy. And you still hear the Chamberlain view sometimes. You'll hear uh, Republicans arguing that, for instance, um, they like to assert that government doesn't create jobs. Well, of course it does. <laughs> of course it does. Anytime anybody spends in the economy, it doesn't matter who spends or what they're buying the economy will be stimulated. That's why we call it a stimulus um, because of that. So here, what this cartoon, I think, there is a huge misunderstanding about the role of deficits and debt in the United States. It's true, the United States runs a chronic deficit, that's the annual budget of the government. And then if we're rolling it over, it becomes part of the debt. OK, so people are all freaky deaky about the deficit and debt. So here's the problem with deficits. They can be inflationary, but you're not running a deficit just for the heck of it. You're trying to get out of a problem in the economy. That's why you're running deficits. And so inflation is not the issue. Unemployment is generally the issue. So in, and we've even heard some people argue against the Biden stimulus package because it was infl because it's going to be potentially inflationary. I don't think it's going to be inflationary. There's just too much ground to be made up still in unemployment. The second reason you don't like deficits is an argument that it crowds out private investment. So if government is spending, borrowing and spending, that could drive up the interest rate. And then when you drive up the interest rate, Business can't borrow and consumers can't borrow because the money's not there or the interest rate has gotten too high. That is not a problem right now. Interest rates are at historic lows and the Federal Reserve Bank has signaled that they will remain at historic lows for a very long time. Another reason that people don't like deficits is they say our grandchildren will have to pay that. And my response to that is, what did my grandchildren ever do for me? You know, I don't have grandchildren yet. So um, you can kick this down. Government down the road, government is not subject to the same financial rules as you and me. We know if we go into deficit or overdraft or something, we have to pay that or we're going to end up with really financial issues. But the government can continue as long as people are willing to loan government money. There's no reason it can't continue to borrow and spend. And this is essential during downturns like we are currently suffering. So right. um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, yes, downturns, as opposed to uh, passing a one plus trillion dollar uh, tax change uh, or uh, tax reduction where the tax exclusion and the benefits of that go to a small percentage of the country that are already at the top of the wealth distribution, um, That's exactly which is what we did during good times. Uh, and so I just wanted to note that there are a lot of these pictures, not like this, but like a lot of cartoons 
regarding the debt. Uh, Messner, you know, it comes up in the Messner cartoons quite a bit, his yes. concern of the debt. And the in Club, it's really interesting. Club, I think it's a Club cartoon shows in 1928, I think. Um, I think it's, I'd have to go back. I, it might be earlier than that, but it, it's a recent president. I can't remember if it's Harding, if it's Coolidge, if it's, but what, anyway, one of them's got an ax and they're chopping off the end of this big log that is uh, essentially spending, uh, government spending for the year. And he's chopping off a hundred million dollars off of it. Okay. Now it's really interesting because this is right before the Great Depression, which is brought on partially because of a drop in consumer spending that is not offset by any other, by government or by business. And so, he, so we're talking about, you know, right before the great, the onset of the Great Depression, here is someone promoting, the cartoon is promoting and, and sort of uh, um, cheering on this, this budget cutting that's happening at the government, le- at the federal government level. Meanwhile, that might very well be part of the reason why we're, why we're in a depression a year later is this drop in spending. Uh, and the hundred million dollar drop in, in spending by the government in 1928 is substantial. Yes, um, indeed. Um, so I do want to just um, steer off a bit and talk about the causes of economic crisis. So when I ask my students what caused the Great Depression, invariably it's the stock market crash. And I have to explain to them that the stock market and movements in the stock market are reflective of economics, not determinant, right, of economics. So you have to look at what causes this drop off in spending. Okay, and there are several things that can cause it. Um, But the two underlying mechanisms that create crises and downturns in economic activity are production technology improvements. So during the uh, Great Depression prior to that, we had uh, assembly line production of, of Fordism, creating all of this massive output. I mean, capitalism is characterized by technological innovation. And then the second thing is a maldistribution of income, which favors savers, not spenders. So you have all of this output coming out from this technological innovation, and then nobody has income to buy it. So you end up with growing inventories. There are two possible responses to growing inventories, cut prices or cut production. In the modern world, starting with the Great Depression, in the modern world, Firms don't cut prices. When is the last time you saw GM cut prices? They don't cut prices, they cut production, they lay off workers. So monopolies and oligopolies and duopolies lay off workers rather than adjustment occurring in prices. So those are the underlying causes and you can see it so clearly in the Great Recession and you can see it, um, now the COVID is kind of a special case because it is a pandemic. But you know, if we had a distribution of income that was more, that were more equitable, perhaps we wouldn't have entered into such a severe downturn. Does that make sense? Okay, uh, my next one, just real quick. Okay, so this is again a huge debate even now in our country, right? So and the world really. So you got the voter and he has two possible routes, prosperity through private enterprise, let markets work, right? Or you can turn off the road and you can see all of those lumps in his road, um, things that are uh, state spending and federal spending and welfare laws, social security, all of these things that, everybody decried about FDR and continued to decry even today, right? The COVID bill, COVID relief bill um, was decried by Republicans as too big of government, right? Government's just too big. So again, the argument that private sector is the way to go and that the public sector, like I said before, is a necessary evil at best. So this is a continuing debate in the economics profession, yeah. unless in the profession, more in the lay public. The profession's made up its mind. The profession is prosperity via private enterprise. <laughs> uh, well, I, I don't know about that, Jeanette. Oh, I, I, well, I, think, I do, because look at I think it's, the macro. I think it would be a mixed. I think, I think most economists would say that 
Uh, there's a mix and a lot of these welfare programs uh, provide benefits to society, uh, but they are poorly managed and they're wasteful. Uh, that's always a common cry you'll, you'll hear, but I just want to go to, know, to the root. You need to go to the root, the ultimate conclusion of the argument. And the ultimate conclusion is for economists that markets work well and we don't need government in there. That's what economists argue in micro in particular, but even in macro now, they talk about the micro foundations of macro, right? So even macroeconomics, which came out of the Great Depression, it's pretty much micro now as well. So I was going to note that this uh, cartoon you're showing is the summer before the uh, Kennedy-Nixon presidential uh, campaign. Uh-huh. Yeah, so it's uh, right. So it's that it's that November that Kennedy will win by a, a small uh, a small margin, uh, and then he'd come in in sixty one, if I'm not mistaken. If, if that's how it would work. So this yeah. is definitely speaking to, you know, Kennedy is talk. Kennedy wants more of this democratic platform of more government spending, welfare state, all of these things, uh, and the Republican platform, a continuation of Ike. Uh, will be with Nixon is this ro- this smooth ride to prosperity through private enterprise. And all I was going to note here, Jeanette, is this is one more case where where you know a very common uh, poor argument that's made is that government spends and it doesn't uh, and it's just spending and it, there's it doesn't generate jobs as Jeanette was saying earlier, and it, and most importantly it doesn't generate economic growth and. It, this is the sort of thinking that always looks at these policies at only the costs of the policy and never at the benefits of the policy. So exactly. I look at this, for example, and I think of, and this is just anecdotal, but my in-laws, my, my mother-in-law and her family. So she was a family of six kids or wait, actually seven or eight kids. And, um, and at this point, all of them were about born. The father who was a war, World War II vet had essentially uh, stranded the family. Um, And so the mother uh, was, you know, without a college education, just a high school graduate, had to fend for herself and, you know, her seven, eight children. And so she leaned on the welfare state. And so she leaned on social security and all the benefits she could get from the government. And now every single one of those kids has a full-time job uh, that all of those children have had children. And all of the grandchildren now have essentially have full time jobs uh, and are not on the welfare state and all of this, all of this calculation. So what is the benefit of supporting this one family? It's upwards of now like 100 people. Who are now providing tax revenue to the system and all of that's overlooked. All of the benefits are never included in the calculation. Instead, it's just what are the costs of this? And if you never look at the benefits then every policy is a bad policy because it's just we're throwing money away. Um, And that's always a really easy um, sort of strategy that people try to use when they bring up government spending um, is to just mention the costs and never the benefits of what we're going to experience. And certainly when we look at World War II and the massive expenditures that we placed into the military and then which were not there before, but have been sustained since World War II, um, it, and which explains most of our deficit spending is the discretionary spending on military, which is not required uh, by uh, our government. We are not required to spend the money that we do in the defense industry like we are required to spend it on Social Security. Uh, and so that spending that we do, all of that deficit spending is going towards military. Most of it, uh, if not two thirds of it goes to military. I think eight cents out of every dollar that we borrow goes towards education. Uh, And so it's really interesting to hear when you start knowing, when you learn some of these economic facts, and then you hear the arguments and you hear, for example, Republicans arguing for, we need to take care of education and education is what matters. Well, it comes for economists, it comes down to dollar and cents. And when 60 to 70 cents of every dollar is being spent on military and eight cents out of every dollar is being spent on education, it's clear what the preference is. Um, So 
anyway, so that I sorry for interrupting, Jeanette. I just uh, no, no, that's fine. I think that's my last cartoon, isn't it? Yeah, that's my last cartoon. I really liked that one too. I, I that was one of the ones I liked. It it displays for me the the continuing debate of the role of the government in the economy. So you have the Republicans saying government. Oh be in the economy let the private sector do it markets work well i don't know what year they're living in because with the turn of the 20th century and large corporations and large labor um, it's just not prices are just not going to equilibrate to optimal solutions they're just not going to do that so when prices don't move employment has to so that's what happens people lay you get laid off become unemployed they decrease their spending so when they decrease their spending that creates more unemployment in the economy so spending is what drives the economy and it doesn't matter i'll say this again it doesn't matter who's spending or what they're spending on just so spending takes place. So I remember my dad, he used to play taps and revelry um, <laughs> for uh, for the National Guard during WW2 in, in the state of Utah. And so he was always tired. So <laughs> he would do the, um, the morning trumpet and then he'd do the afternoon trumpet and he'd nap in between. So he got actually kicked out of the... <laughs> kicked out of it. I didn't even know they could kick people out. But what they were doing, what the National Guard was doing was taking rocks from one side of the road and moving them to the other side of the road. And then the next day, they would take those same rocks and move them back again. It is going to create growth because people have income they didn't have before. So they go out and they spend it. That creates economic growth and prosperity. But um, yeah. I have a question that came in. I figured it'd be a good time to ask. Um, one of our attendees asked uh, for both of you, if you could uh, speak to, so what is the opinion of the recent fixing the infrastructure bill, tax bill by Biden? Do you want to take it, have you? What, can you say it again? What is your opinion around the recent oh. fixing of so, the- So, okay, so- the so uh, I'm saying I'm smiling because um, the the infrastructure charge and was was an, a central component of the Trump platform four year four plus years ago. OK, and when I was doing some background work for this, I happened to come across an article that was written in 2016 talking about um, how to finance some of the platform items uh, in the different campaigns. And one of them was infrastructure. And so, and it was a conservative outlet talking about the importance of infrastructure investment, um, because at the time it was a Trump platform and therefore the conservative outlet was for this. Uh, but it was interesting because uh, it, that is one of those items that the federal government uh, in this country needs, is responsible for and needs to take leadership in improving the infrastructure. Now, I think traditionally we think of infrastructure as better roads, um, better buildings. Like we think that's like what we think of infrastructure, but the infrastructure in the modern day is, I, I mean, the United States is just getting left behind in industries like cybersecurity. Um, and uh, so like we are not like, and it's very clear that we are not at the frontier of either hacking or preventing hacks. Um, and, uh, and so there's like the cybersecurity infrastructure is in, in, incredi incredibly important. And with these infrastructure developments moving towards cleaner energy, all of that type of development, what's missing from a lot of the conversation is just how much it drives employment. And not just employment at the superficial level where if I'm expanding green energy, that means more solar panels and therefore there needs to be more workers in that industry. Well, it's every other industry that that feeds into solar panels, um, and then it's all the industries that feed into that. And then once those all of those workers are receiving money, there's this multiplier effect of spending. Uh, and so, the impact that federal government spending can have is very much is very often 
more than a dollar for your investment. So you put a dollar in, you get far more than a dollar back. That's um, right. And you also, um, the deficit that is generated is partially offset because you have people now working and they have incomes and they are paying their taxes. So on the infrastructure, uh, that was a very interesting question. Infrastructure has one of the largest multiplier effects. So the multiplier effect is the notion that if I go out and I spend, I get $100 and I spend 80 of it and save 20 of it, that 80 becomes income for somebody else. And they're going to spend 80% of 80, which would be what, 556 or something um, on down the line. And so the impact on the economy is a multiple. So when you have a $1 change under that scenario I just gave you, a $1 change in government spending, you're gonna end up with a $4 change in gross domestic product. It's a big bang for the buck. And the largest bang comes from infrastructure. And a lot of the infrastructure development will rely on equipment and manufactured goods that are actually produced within the US. You know, this is something that's overlooked um, in development economics when uh, answering the question, why would we invest in developing some other country, developing some other country's infrastructure? Well, one of the answers is, well, that country is not as developed. And so when it starts building a dam or roads or whatever it's building, it's going to need resources. And so when we lend money, we can also put strings attached to it. We can also attach strings to it that say, well, you need to buy a certain amount of American equipment from Caterpillar or John Deere or whatever it might be. And so we're giving money away, but then the money's coming right back. And then as that country develops with good relations, those, tr- those lines of trade potentially yield more economic growth in that country, which of course will mean that we as trading partners also benefit from. It. Um, exactly. And so uh, I, I think the infrastructure is way overdue, uh, is, is long, long overdue. And, and it's because of this lack of major federal investment which did happen. We we did have some after the Great Recession, but it was undone during the Trump administration. Um, Like that's exactly, it's very expensive. Yes, it's very expensive. But if you only look at how it costs, $1 trillion of cost, well then of course you wouldn't want to do it. If I said it costs $1 trillion, but over the next 20 years, it's going to generate $100 trillion. Well, then that seems like a pretty good bargain. Uh, And so, but that's a little bit difficult to say, like, what are going to be the benefits? But, you know, Jeanette brought up building roads back in uh, the 50s after World War II. Well, what's the benefit of the interstate highway system? I I mean, the amount of commerce, the amount of travel that these roads get, um, the reduction of what we call transaction costs, not just in private business, but also just in personal business, um, that, like, and also these infrastructure develop changes that the Biden administration is suggesting also impact other things that sometimes GDP doesn't count, things like improvements in health. So for example, in the last two years of the Trump administration, not including the COVID time, there was economic growth, okay, more than 2% growth. However, there was a decline in life expectancy. So like that's not incorporated into this fairy tale of how great economic growth was during the Trump administration. If you take into account that more people are dying and people's lives are being shortened, well then that doesn't sound like great growth uh, and and an improvement in the standard of living for the country. Uh, And the standard of living should be what we're thinking about. And that standard of living is a composite of GDP per capita, so income per capita, but also health per capita access to education, access to access to quality health care. Uh, all of these things matter too, and they usually do not get incorporated into a measure of GDP. Um, so I wanted, to, uh, so if, can I have, I don't know, can I share my screen? Oh yeah. Yeah, perfect. So here is, I just wanted to put this one up. I had cut this one out, but I just really like it. And it builds off of something Jeanette was saying. So Messner, in all of his cartoons, when he depicts business, the business person is always well-dressed, uh, is, is drawn sophisticated, uh, well-groomed, and all of this. 
and, and is usually pre- always actually presented in a very good light. Here, this one's called All Aboard for Prosperity. So this is the Prosperity Bus. And I think everyone can see this. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, expand it a little bit. And so you can see the people who are on it, the regular work workers, which, and this is true for club and Messner, there are no women or people of color represented in these cartoons. It is almost strictly men. And if there is a woman, it is very rare that a woman is represented in these, uh, in these cartoons. And so here we have all men representing wage earners, farmers, small business, uh, the salary man, and they're all on this board to pros- or, or on this bus to prosperity in 1925. So this is the middle of the Roaring Twenties. And up here on the bus, it says, "Live and let live, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, play square." And then, all aboard! Here comes big business. And so big business just steps on everybody's toes as they walk as it walks through and uh, joins this ride to prosperity. And I just find it interesting that Club is a little bit more even-handed in his depictions. Uh, He depicts business well at times, and other times he depicts uh, business poorly. Um, And so that would be, um, so I I guess I'm just going to hold on to the presentation for now. I remember the order, Liz. So which brings me to my first uh, cartoon. Um, And so... Here you can see this is a portrayal or a depiction of business that uh, Club uses a couple times in his cartoons. Uh, And so you can see this is not a very flattering picture of business. And in this case, what he is depicting in 19, I I, I think it's 1921. Yeah, 1921 is the monopolist, uh, which is the Bell Telephone Monopoly. Okay, so at this point, Bell owns all the local service, I'm sorry, controls all local service for phones and long distance service. And there's a lot of reasons for why the monopoly uh, came about. Uh, Part of it was, similar story with railroads, when the infrastructure for telephones started to be rolled out, uh, there are all these competing firms who were putting up essentially different, using different standards. And so that made connecting different networks difficult. And so the federal government's response to this was, well, let's just give one firm control over everything. uh, And that way, the same standard will be used. And so that's essentially the rise of Bell, the Bell Telephone Company, uh, which becomes a monopoly. And so here in the state of New York, and so I'm going to focus in over here. How do I know it's New York? Well, besides that these cartoonists are Rochesterian uh, or local Rochester cartoonists, we have this little uh, picture of Governor, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Nathan Miller. Well, I've got a few notes here, so let me. And so here, you know, this loving picture of Nathan Miller, the governor, sits on the monopolist's desk. And the monopolist is filling out this fill in your own rates and from the governor. So the governor is essentially saying to the monopolist, you just figure out the rates, put down whatever you want. And that's the amount of oversight that the governor is providing the setting of rates in his own state. And you can see the typical depiction of a monopolist, how much the monopolist cares about the consumer. Here is the consumer's special, the new special complaint bureau, which is the trash can. And so you can see the monopolist cares about one thing and one thing only, his bulging belly. And so obviously he's going to put rates in here. Now, I like this for as someone who teaches microeconomics and teaches monopoly theory, classic monopoly theory tries to, at least when I'm teaching it, I try to debunk this idea that monopolists can charge any rate, okay? Because they wouldn't charge such a high rate that no one would use their service, okay? So there is and still among them in a monopolist, there's still a desire to maximize the profit that you can make from this sweet setup that you have, which is you control the entire market. Um, And so I just love, I I really like this portrayal of the monopolist. It's done in 1921, just a few years after the Clayton Antitrust Act, which um, expanded antitrust legislation to incorporate um, specifically some price, um, some bad pricing behavior by firms, as well as recognizing, this gets back to an earlier theme, 
the Clayton Antitrust Act recognizes laborers, workers, as not a commodity, okay, which is an important change. Uh, so commodity firms buy commodities like raw materials. Um, and so raw materials don't have rights. The raw, you know, raw materials don't get to organize and they don't get treated as humans. Um, and if you treat labor as a commodity, well, then that's how they get treated, like commodities. And so the Clay Clayton Antitrust Act has language asserting, ex essentially expanding uh, rights and the role of labor organizations. Um, and so it's really interesting. This is being drawn. And obviously, from a local perspective, the people be squeezed. And so I, I've been trying to find the history of this line, the people be pleased. And I do think that that was part of a jingle, possibly an advertising jingle in this area by the Bell Monopoly or by the phone company that included the words, the people be, sque the people be pleased. And Club has taken that and turned it into the people be squeezed. Uh, and so it's a really, I think it's a really nifty uh, cartoon that captures a lot of our, our concerns with monopoly. And regarding uh, the governor at the time, um, Nathan Miller, he, he is a graduate from SUNY Cortland, uh, before it was called SUNY Cortland, but nonetheless SUNY Cortland. He was a corporate lawyer for Carnegie and helped Carnegie um, and that corporation navigate this new antitrust world of the early 20th century to essentially form U.S. Steel, which was essentially a monopoly without the moniker trust or monopoly. Um, and so U.S. Steel lasted past all of the breakups, like for example, uh, that would occur to other industries. At, and just as a last note, the Bell monopoly would not get broken up until the 80s. And it would be partly because of MCI, which stands for Microwave Communication, uh, Communications Incorporated, and their desire to enter the long distance market and provide long distance service using satellites or, or dishes that were sending microwave signals instead of relying on actual physical lines carrying the signal. Um, so anyway, I found that one just to be fascinating. Uh, and so we're right up against time. So let me pick my other one, and this is timely. So this one, uh, the title of this, I don't think I can say the word right, is le le legitimate. Uh, and so I can, I'll uh, focus up on it. It's right at, here at the top, ledger domain, legitimate. I'm not sure how to say that. I did look it up. And what it means is a skillful use of one's hands when performing conjuring tricks. And so what we have here, and let me get down to the um, year of this, is 1931. And so what we have is we're at the start of the Depression, some of the worst years in, the contra in terms of contracting the contraction of the, of the economy and drops in the rise in unemployment and, and really the beginning of the heart of the Great Depression. And we want to solve, we're looking for ways to solve this. And one of them is, you know, states and the federal government are, don't have the tax revenue that they had not so long ago. And there's also the issue of prohibition. And prohibition runs from, let me see here, I have that note here too, from 1920 to 1933. And so here we have clearly uh, a pro legalization of beer, but a pro-legalization cartoon, and it's all the benefits that come from legalizing alcohol. And you'll note millions in revenue for the U.S. Treasury, the industries of harps, well, agricultural industry will be affected because more hops and barley will be needed. Uh, we have all of these tangential uh, markets, like barroom towels. I do not know what a bung starter is, <laughs> a spigot. Uh, the beer bottle industry. Up here, we have eight, 108 or 180,000 freight cars rolling um, uh, related to this because of the coal that's needed at the breweries. And so this obviously is, look, we're, we're, in, this prob we're in this problem time of the Great Depression. Here's an easy solution. Legalize alcohol. 
And what's interesting is before the income tax was passed in the early 20th century, liquor represented one third of all the federal revenues of all the tax revenue generated. And then prohibition drove that from drove that to zero. So part of our interest in the income tax and starting the income tax, uh, which started in the late 19 teens or early 1920s, was to replace the revenues that we lost because of prohibition and the loss of all this liquor tax. And, um, and so here we have it coming back. And I thought this was timely because of our own state's legalization of uh, marijuana. And, and you're hearing the same thing. So right now they're suggesting three and a half billion dollar uh, revenue, tax revenue. That's what, so that's the thing i so I keep getting mixed up. I hear 3.5 revenue and sometimes they're saying it's tax revenue. Other times it's just sales revenue that they're predicting from the legalization of weed in five years or so, you know, down the line. And, uh, and then if it's $3.5 billion, let's just say $4 billion in sales revenue, the tax is 9%, let's just say 10%. So that's $400 million per year in just state tax revenue. However, that relies on the federal government not legalizing cannabis. Because the second the federal government legalizes it, that opens up interstate commerce. Right now, every state has legalized, the states that have legalized it, you cannot ship that product out of the state. And you cannot import the product from out of state. Everything has to be internal. And so we have these barriers to trade that the typical Interstate Commerce Act or the ICC should be breaking down. But until the federal government actually does something, um, it's important to get on this bandwagon ASAP to earn the tax revenue at the state level to pay for things like locally, we're talking about reparations. Uh, so anyway, I thought that, uh, and I'll stop there. Uh, I thought that would be a good one to show. Uh, and let me stop sharing. There we go. Um, well, that was good. You guys, that was a lot. <laughs> that was awesome. Um, I want to see, we have like a few more minutes. If anybody had additional, any questions they wanted to ask of uh, Dr. Mitchell or Dr. Espinoza, we have a few moments left. So um, this isn't really a question because I'm not sure I know enough to ask a question right now, but I did want to see this. This was actually really interesting, although I I missed some bits in the middle when I was having some connection and audio issues, um, but I, I found it fascinating to go back and look at these um, historical cartoons and see the same conversations playing out. And it's and it's not something I'm not a historian, I'm not an economic <laughs> economist. Um, it's not something that I had really thought about uh, in too much detail before. And and when we talk about historic history, right? We talk about the presidents who succeeded one another and all these kinds of things. I don't know, sometimes it, it just seems like a foregone conclusion that, you know, somebody needed to come in, FDR needed to come in and, and do something, right? Like we don't, and that's perhaps the worst example, because of course, that's probably one where the policy um, distinctions are the most well known, but I'm rambling. All I wanted to say was thank you very much. I really enjoyed this conversation um, and, it, and it really spurred me to sort of think about some things in slightly different ways. So thank you. Well, thanks for that, Bonnie. I would say that you know, historically, yeah. there are these moments, these singular moments that of crises that enable uh, leaders to engage in major changes or major investments. Um, and we've had recent events like that, but it's been striking to me to see how, for in, squander isn't the right word, but squandering, for example, uh, an, an opportune time to unite a country around a single cause um, and a single moment, and instead, like, it turning into these. So we've had three in the 20 years, 9-11, the Great Recession, and COVID. And the Great Recession is an example where it does seem like people came together a little bit more, but 9-11, uh, instead of uniting, became a divisive, uh, especially sort of the wars that came after, especially uh, invading Iraq, the Patriot Act, all of these became rather uh, divisive. 
And then certainly with COVID, I, I just, it's as someone who, who studies healthcare economics and has done quite a bit of reading way before the pandemic on the 1918 influenza uh, pandemic, it's just been utterly shocking. And, uh, and I would really recommend John, John Barry's book on the uh, pandemic of 1918, because it gives, a hist it gives a little bit of a story of the history that's going on at that time, which includes a crackdown by the, oh, I just forgot, uh, by the president at the time, whose name I just Wilson. forgot. Wilson, right? Crackdown by Wilson on anti-American or un-American activities. What was the author of that again? There was a book I read recently, but that one sounds really good. John too. Barry. The last name is B A B A R R Y. All right, and I do have to run. I'm sorry, I've got a one o'clock meeting that I that I need to get. To, but thank you, um, Javier Jeanette. Thank you so much. I very much appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for attending.